Yes, it's John G. Sutton. Tales from the Jails. There you go again. The twitch has shifted to my eyebrows. Oops, there we go. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for joining me again. I'm going to talk again today about the stress that prison officers experience whilst working in the prisons. Start with a story from yesterday that I recounted on my live broadcast for all of you that missed it. It's on the site. I uploaded it and uh, you can watch it there. But I want to talk a little bit about a guy. Uh, talk about stress for prison officers in general and the pressures that are brought to bear by working uh, in in the prison system. Because it's, it's, it's worse for staff than it is for, for inmates many times because the prison officers, if they're unprepared, you know, generally new staff are unprepared to face uh, the dangers and temptations that await within the prisons. Uh, I want to talk a bit about one poor guy who just uh, was overcome by the stress and accusations that were made against him. He, he was serving on uh, what used to be known as HMP Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight, which is now known as HMP Isle of Wight. Yeah, it's a serious prison, and uh, the, the poor guy there was named Matthew Law, and he was aged 29, and uh, numerous accusations were made by various inmates accusing him of corruption, and uh, he was uh, subsequently unable to handle this, and believe this or <clears throat> not, he hung himself inside the prison. He was found hanging uh, in, on one of the wings in HMP on the Isle, Isle of Wight. Yeah, so <clears throat> these things can get you down. And subsequently it was found that there were absolutely no grounds to believe that any of the accusations were at any substance whatsoever. But they were so serious that uh, he... Uh, couldn't face it any longer and terminated his life, which is extremely sad. And his father before him had been a prison officer, and no doubt he thought that he would follow in his father's footsteps. Very unfortunate, and rest in peace, Matthew Law. Yeah. Now, when I was in the prison service, I saw numerous staff break under the under the pressures. There was uh, one officer who joined. He he was a former senior non-commissioned officer, in fact the most senior non-commissioned officer in the Royal Air Force <clears throat> and he joined the prison service and they seemed to believe that this man was going to be on rapid promotion and uh, for the first few days of his service there he was attached to work with me <clears throat> and uh, I showed him round the, the prison, showed him what was happening and I did caution him, I said these people uh, extremely sophisticated criminals. Uh, a lot of them are lifetime offenders. They've been in and out of prison since they were children. The families are recidivists. They come from long lines of, of, of people who commit offences and they won't think twice about trying to take advantage of you. So you have to be absolutely on your guard all the time. So don't think that you can just simply befriend them. And do you know, he said to me, he said, uh, I have been handling men for the last 30 years. I've been the most senior non-commissioned officer in the Royal Air Force. I have organised parades for Her Majesty the Queen. I have met the Queen. On, give me a lecture like that. I said, I'm just telling you, you know, be very careful. Anyway, I, after his two days with me, he was making notes everywhere we went. After his two days with me, he was uh, subsequently posted to work on D-Wing at the Scrubs. And on D-Wing, they had the life, life, lifers, you know, the people who were doing lifetimes five or whatever it is and stuff like that. Long-term prisoners, Tony Lambriano was on there. Uh, who else was it? Yeah, 
there was there was Gordon Goody, that one of the train robbers was on there. That there, there were a number of high profile inmates. Yeah, who are Jeremy, uh, the guy who played Dirty Den, he was on there. Lots of them, and uh, I never thought no more about this guy actually, because I worked on C Wing, you see. Anyway, about two months later, I happened to be talking to one of the D Wing staff. I said, uh, "How's he going on that?" Uh, and I gave him his name. I've forgotten his name now. But I said, "How's he going on?" I said, uh, "How well do you know him?" I said, uh, "I only know that the first two days he was with me, and I cautioned him. You know, I said, obviously he didn't do the job properly." I said he's been sacked. What he'd been doing was he was in there very long, and they found that he was running bets. You know, the inmates on d -Wing wanted to put bets on, so he was taking bets for them to the bookies down Duquesne Road. He was smuggling in whiskey and tobacco for them. And uh, basically, he, he, they had twisted him. Just like, as simple as that, yeah. Because he actually believed that he could handle these men in, in, a, in a perfectly normal way. There's only one way to deal to deal with people who are so sophisticated and they, this con men. I mean, like uh, <clears throat> John Stonehouse, he was a con man. He managed to get the governors doing things for him. When it came to dealing with Stonehouse, the answer is you prisoner, me jailer. That's it. But he was a highly, highly clever man, Stonehouse. He got people doing all sorts for him. And that's what happened to that uh, ex-senior NCO from the Royal Air Force. He was twisted by highly intelligent criminals. You've got to be careful with these people. They've got to know that you don't give a shit about them. Because if they think that you can twist you, they will. Anyway, I saw one or two go absolutely stark staring bonkers. Uh, as well as being corrupted, because there were a number of obviously corrupt officers there, but you try trapping them. It isn't that straightforward. One of the governors was smuggling letters out for one of the Category A prisoners. I caught him at it, reported it. What do you think happened there? I've told you previously in this, yeah, they, the police came in, but they didn't come in to investigate him. They came in to investigate me. Prisoners on the wing were saying, What have you been up to, Mr. Sutton? Hey, what have you been up to, boss? Oh, I've been up to anything. I've been doing my job. Oh, no, he said, Senior CID down there asking questions about you. All I'd done was my job and reported this governor for. What was he doing? He was smuggling letters out and what have you and he was in return he was being sexually serviced by one of the category A gangsters on C2 landing you imagine that yeah so it's easily to be corrupted it depends what you're corrupted with the uh, one of the prison chaplains one of the vicars you know I caught him in the cells one day uh, well the, the inmate was preparing himself for the vicar to come in and I said why are you dressed like a choir boy you know he's not allowed you know and he said I can't tell you so, but eventually he did tell me a little bit of subtle pressure you know no violence but he did tell me that uh, on the Saturday afternoons when everybody was on exercise he, he was down on his hands and knees dressed as a choir boy fellating the vicar for those of you who don't know what fellatio is, it generally means sucking the todger. Yeah. Now, at strange ways, I mean, eventually after a number of assaults, by staff on me, by the way, not inmates. Inmates, generally speaking, didn't attack me because I was being straightforward with them. But uh, a number of members of staff attacked me and eventually I was assaulted by a senior officer and uh, my doctor signed me off sick, never went back. That's how I left the prison service, by being medically discharged. They sent me to see a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist said, uh, I think that you're 
perfectly sane, Mr. Sutton. So, but I feel that the system is absolutely mad. He said, and you are not to return. So that was the end of that. I never did go back to the prison service. And here I am, many, many years, over 40 years later. I've done a lot since then. You wonder, is that all you've done, eh? being a jailer, yeah, 40 years ago? Have a look, Google me. Look, look on Amazon, yeah? Type in John G. Sutton, yeah? Go on to uh, eBay, type in John G. Sutton, yeah? I managed Derek Akora, who was the, uh, without hands down, the most famous psychic medium that's been in this country since Doris Stokes. I managed Derek Akora, wrote his book, The Psychic World of Derek Akora. I managed James Byrne, who was another psychic, took him to the London Palladium. I hired the London Palladium. I managed PJ Proby, who was the uh, big name singer from the 1960s, featured alongside the Beatles on uh, the, the, the Jack Good special uh, Around the Beatles in 1964. He had numerous big hits. His big hit was Somewhere There's a Place for Us. Yeah. He turned out to be a, a paedophile, so I reported him. That was the end of that. Yeah. So anyway, if you think that's all I've done, have a look, yeah? Anyway, uh, today is 45 years since the death of one of my favourite singers. Certainly I loved him when I was a kid. Elvis Presley died 45 years ago today. And because I've been used to doing some songs, I'm going to do one from Elvis Presley. The, the song that was the big breakthrough for him got him international acclaim. Uh, Heartbreak Hotel. Now, I ain't particularly good at this. Don't tell me you hadn't guessed. If you've been watching this channel, then you already know that I torture them a little bit and spit them out in bits. So here we go. Let's see what I can do with Heartbreak Hotel. Well, since my baby left me, I found a new place to dwell. It's down the end of Lonely Street at Heartbreak Hotel. I'll be ever so lonely, baby. Well, I'll be so lonely. I'll be so lonely. I could die. Although it's always crowded, you still can find some room for broken-hearted lovers to cry there in their gloom. They say it's so lonely, oh, they'll be lonely, they'll be so lonely, they could die. Now the bellow's tears keep flowing, the desk clerk's dressed in black. They've been so long on lonely street, they'll never look in back. Get so lonely, well, they're so lonely, yeah, they're so lonely. They could die. Well, now, if your baby leaves you, you've got a tale to tell. Well, take a walk down Lonely Street to Heartbreak Hotel. You're gonna be, yeah, you will be lonely. You'll be so lonely. You'll be so lonely. You could die. Although it's always crowded, you still can find some room for broken-hearted lovers to cry there in the gloom. Where get to? They get so lonely. They get so lonely. They get so lonely. They could die. There you go, Elvis Presley. One of my heroes from when I was a kid. Still got loads of his records on my jukebox. Yeah. Got a jukebox here. You want to see my jukebox? I'll show you my jukebox. Around here somewhere. There you go. 
Jones, Jones juice box. Yeah. There you go. So, I'm told by Sean Atwood's team that they're soon going to be uh, putting up my interview that I did with them. It ran two hours when I did it. They said that they're editing it. So, what they do with the edit, I don't know. It'll probably be down to 10 minutes. Probably down to me saying, uh, this is John G. Sutton, this is Sean Atwood. Nice to see you. Anyway, uh, have a look at Sean's channel. It's called True Crime, I believe. Sean Atwood, anybody who's on there. Uh, and the other guy I did some interviews for, was re it was Real Porridge with Sam. Yeah, that's a good one too. Anyway, Tales from the Jails. Hope you've enjoyed this. Do subscribe, like, and all the rest of it. See you soon.